a book dropping in the library would send kids hiding under the table because it sounded like a gun. Those are the things people don't think about. They think life goes back to normal and it doesn't. A lot of the families I think have wanted to not necessarily make a memorial site, but to have some sort of goodness come out of this. We have a lot, more, we have a lot of charities in Newtown now. I think almost every family has started one who's still here. And I think that's become an important part of the town of something has to happen from this. Over the last four years, we have been gaining political power. We have been getting stronger as a movement every single day. There were certainly warning signs that if someone knew how to read them, we could have prevented this. All these horrific shootings are preventable if we know what to do. Newtown is an interesting community. It's a self-selecting place. People move there for a reason. It's still close enough to New York City that you can, you know, get back and forth, you know, in about an hour. Um, but it's far enough away that, you know, you sort of feel like you're in a universe of your own. We moved to Newtown in 2005 and we purposely selected that town because of the school system, which had a great music program, as well as academics and um, the public library, and just the feel in the town was just one of uh, a you know peaceful community with people who were you know friendly and nice, and it was just a pleasant place to live. We relocated to Newtown in 2007 to, to raise our family. It really worked well for us because we were able to be with our kids around the clock. And I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, I would be up early with the kids and I just got to spend um, a lot of quality time, you know, bonding with my three children, which was, uh, I just feel very fortunate to have had that opportunity. For whatever reason, Daniel got up to walk his siblings to the bus with me. James's bus was at 6.30 and, and Daniel was up and wanted to walk him to the bus and hug him and kiss him and tell him he loved him. And then he wanted to do the same and walk Natalie to her bus at 7.30. And um, which is not unusual for Daniel to, to want to do that. It was a beautiful uh, blue sky, crisp December day. And I remember thinking that it was fun because it was Friday. And I remember thinking, oh, this is gonna be a great day. And then at 8.30, I walked Daniel uh, to his bus. And I hugged him and kissed him and he told him that I loved him. And um, off the bus went and I went back to the house to, to work on a recording project. And um, I started getting text messages and emails and phone calls about a lockdown in the district. Typically we would have been walking down the hall at about 9.30, but we were actually in the library by about 20 after 9 and already sitting down getting our lesson started. And, um, and that's when I, you know, we started to hear some sounds that we couldn't immediately identify. And I remember saying to the class, Everybody quiet down, what is, that, what is that noise that I hear? I started getting more detailed information that there were reports of a shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, which was just very foreign and uh, uh, shocking to hear. We were watching a news clip and a woman was saying, out, standing outside the school and she was saying, uh, the principal had been shot and I thought, that can't be right, <laughs> you know, it, it was an unbelievable thing. My first thought was, there's no way that that's a real that that's a real threat, that that was something that really took place. Um, and I, so I kind of put it out of my mind for a little bit and I told my professor when we had a kind of break in the class that um, I just got this news and I really wanted to just confirm that everything was okay. And um, so I was trying to reach my, reach my mom, reach my brother, reach my dad. And I flew down to the school and arrived on this, uh, this scene 
like nothing I'd ever seen before, with more emergency vehicles and personnel in one place than I've ever seen. At this little, this little school down our country lane that I had been to dozens of times as all three of my children were in that school, and as a stay-at-home dad, I would be in there a lot. It was hard to identify because I, I don't think I've ever heard gunshots before in real life. It doesn't sound like it does in the movies. Uh, and then, and then there was a report that there, were, maybe the principal had been shot, and I started immediately gearing up for how to have this conversation with this very sweet, caring, sensitive, compassionate little boy, and how to explain to Daniel, you know, about this horrific tragedy. I had to get my keys and lock the doors to the library, and um, the doors, the locks were on the outside of the doors. So that meant I had to go into the hallway to lock the doors and pull them closed. And um, my key didn't work on the last door. There were two double doors, another door, and then there was a doorway at the end of the room that my key didn't, didn't work. There's a firehouse just down the road from the school where they were collecting the children from the school and they were assembling them by grade order. They were holding up signs, first grade, second grade, and I was milling around waiting for Daniel to show up in the first grade line and the, the lines were getting smaller as the kids were being collected and brought home by their families. So I remember thinking, okay, I just barricade as much as I can against the door, which is what I did. I know Daniel, where's Daniel's class? I'm asking around, where's Daniel's class? And you know, they didn't know, maybe not all of the classes had been taken out of the school yet. And so my neighbor and friend, Melissa, um, had collected her son, Kyle, who was Daniel's best friend. And she called her husband to, to pick Kyle up and she insisted on staying with me until I, until I got Daniel. They had to crawl on the floor quietly and we had to get into the closet. And one of them said, why? And I said, because we have to find the best hiding place in the school. And another one said, do we get a prize? And I said, yes, you do, you get a prize. And one of them said, is it candy? <laughs> I said, yep, it's candy. It's all the candy you want. You just said, remember, it's a quiet game and we're going, we're crawling on the floor and we're gonna go into the back closet. The kids were all absolutely brave and amazing and wonderful. We were the last class that was evacuated by the SWAT team out of the building um, because they couldn't find us. So when the SWAT team came, we had no idea what was happening on the outside. It was late in the day, it was like four, when I found out that Abiel had died. My dad called um, and spoke to my mom, who was working there at the time and said that he had, <clears throat> he had spoken to her, Aviel's dad, Jeremy, and they were talking about some logistics. Jeremy needed people to be able to park in our driveway. And my dad said, well, sure, but yeah, of course, but Aviel's okay, right? And Jeremy said, no, she's gone. And then they brought everybody who was left into a room with the governor and the state police where they announced to us that uh, that 21st grade children had been shot to death along with six teachers. And that's when I knew that our sweet little Daniel was, was gone. And um, five years later, I can't wrap my head around the fact that my little Daniel is gone and that he's gone forever. I'm just never going to get used to that. And he's gone because of somebody else's choice, which is, which is a hard pill to swallow. One of the most difficult things is that once this happens, it shakes your whole foundation of safety and it feels like you can never again say 
Oh, that's okay. You'll be safe. Because you're not. Aviel, I would say, was very bright. And not, not just that like, she was smart, although she definitely was very smart, but that she was a sparkly type person. She was a really engaged child. So she was used to being with grown-ups, and she was used to being with grown-ups who respected her as a human and as a member of their family. You know, they, didn't, they never talked down to her in any way. He was um, such an active participant in everything in our, in our home. And he wanted to be part of the getting ready for Thanksgiving. And I have this image in my head. He had a, a little sweater vest on. He wanted to be dressed up. And he wore his little, his little, um, his little headdress that he made in school for Thanksgiving. And he had that on and his little vest on. And he had the vacuum cleaner, which was probably taller than he was. And he was vacuuming, trying to, trying to help out and get ready for his cousins coming over. It's the kind of kid he was. You know, what I got from being there that day is that, um, that that pain is indescribable even to watch. Um, and it, it just made me realize that I needed to spend part of my life in a way that made sure that no parent ever had to go through that moment ever again. I mean, having just watched parents go through that moment of realization that your child is not coming back made me commit right there that I was going to make sure that um, I lived my life in a way that lessened the chances that something like that would ever happen to any other set of parents ever again. And it's almost as if people are able to hear about them and kind of go on with their day and say, wow, that was really terrible. But, um, you know, it's just kind of part of the life in, in America. Yeah, surviving has taken on every form, including literal and um, it's a, uh, it's a very day-to-day -day process, very minute-to-minute. -minute. Um, I guess, as you could imagine, everyone has suffered and dealt with loss, and any little thing can, can set you off a, a, a sight, a, a, a random memory, a, a song, a, a, any number of things, and it'll blindside you. You know, I'll, I'll get, I'll just, experience something that'll take me back and or remind me of Daniel and uh, I want to hold on to a, a sweet memory and enjoy you know the happy times with Daniel and for me it quickly just disintegrates into just real sadness like a real deep profound sadness that I, I th th that's almost tangible to me but I, I can't I can't find an appropriate word to describe it it's uh, it's a deep sense of longing. Safety was a, uh, my biggest issue, and not necessarily just my own safety, but the safety of my family, my children, um, my students, my friends. That was the work I had to do. Uh, I had to think about things differently. Um, I couldn't walk into a store anymore and not think about where are the exits. Where would be good places to hide? You know, how would we get out of here? I don't randomly choose a seat in a restaurant anymore. For the first time, people were talking about gun violence prevention in a way that they hadn't previously. It was the next day after the shooting that their, um, the organization Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America was founded. Many people have um, gotten involved in um, trying to learn about the issue of gun violence. In general, neighbors helping neighbors and um, people supporting one another. I mean, I think about that all the time. The guy that shot and killed my little Daniel and all those other people had been planning that for at least a year, from what we know. I think every gun death is preventable. Had he not had 30 round magazines, um, I'm almost certain that more kids would have survived. We know that five or six kids ran out while he was fumbling with an exchange. What if he had to change clips every 10 bullets rather than every 30 bullets? Something has to happen from this. And 
all of those families are striving to have some piece of good, whether it be better gun legislation or mental health or just a nice place for kids to be able to go and play. It's not a silver lining because there is no silver lining in this. It's a nightmare. The issue of background checks is controversial nowhere else in the country but the United States Congress and a handful of state legislatures. The NRA has created the reputation um, uh, of controversy around the issue of gun laws. It's not that controversial. You know, one of the big misconceptions that we get a lot is that um, gun violence prevention means banning guns or taking away guns or something like that, and that's just not true and that's just not the case. One of the reasons that people go right to the defensive or right, right to a Second Amendment perspective when you say the words gun control is because you're saying the words gun control. Um, I don't say those words. Control is a, is a misnomer and it frightens people and it should. Um, gun safety, I think, is, is, is more accurate. It resonates with people who are responsible gun owners. This is not a, a strictly a gun issue. This is not a mental health issue. They are not mutually exclusive. This is a public health crisis. Some more research led us to realize, to understand that when somebody takes their life, they talk about it first. When somebody hurts somebody, before somebody hurts somebody else, they talk about it first. Seven out of 10 people who complete suicide talk about it to other people first. Um, eight out of 10 of these horrific mass shooters talk about it first. So they're giving off warning signs. So now imagine if people around them knew what to do with that information. So that's what we do. We train students and teachers and parents how to recognize those warning signs and then how to take the appropriate next step to get that person help before it becomes a tragedy. People are killed by guns day after day after day by the, by the hundreds. If this was any other issue, any other issue, we would be throwing money at it and talking about it in Congress and we would be trying to find ways to deal with it. Whenever you hear about a latest shooting, instead of having that be something that discourages you, use that to motivate you and use that to call your, your representatives and call your elected officials and join your local Moms Demand Action chapter and, and get motivated and, and work and be part of the solution to ending gun violence. There have been state laws that have changed. There have been referendums that have passed. There have been um, anti-gun uh, violence champions that have been elected to state legislatures and to Congress. There have been organizations started that didn't exist prior to Sandy Hook. You know, I think that the town still sparkles. It's still a strong uh, school system, and it's still, um, it's a lovely community. My, my family and, and, and wonderful network of friends in our community have literally um, been our lifeline. So to rely on that is, is, is one piece of advice. And then for me personally, um, involving myself in, in, in this in this good work of helping others and preventing similar tragedies um, is richly rewarding um, to be able to do that. Um, so that's been my personal journey that I've found to be um, my own kind of personal therapy. We're not as strong as the gun lobby is. It may take us another five years to get there, but we're on a journey um, that uh, started uh, on that tragic day in December of 2012. Right, every one person, every one voice, every one conversation makes a difference. That's how this works. That's how you change the culture. That's how you, that's a social movement there. They need all of our voices. They need to hear from everyone. No matter what it is that you can do, do something. <laughs>